Hi, Jennifer. Your audio is working okay? Audio seems to be working okay, I hope. That's great. Everybody can hear Jennifer. Okay. And can you see me too? I can. I can. Great. So our next our next presenter is all the way from the East Coast in Nova Scotia, uh, presenting on digital tools for EAP purposes. As Jennifer McDonald, thank you very much, Jennifer, for being here today. And I'll pass over the presenter rights to you and mute myself. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hope you can hear me. Um, thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Nathan, for a really wonderful presentation. Um, I can't wait myself to, to fire up all of those programs and apps and uh, start experimenting with them. Um, so just wanting to make sure everyone can hear me OK? Hopefully. OK, great. Um, all right, I'll just wait here, I guess, for the PowerPoint. All right. Um, great. Maybe uh, just while we're waiting for the PowerPoint to be uh, put up. Oh, here it comes. Okay. Um, all right. So as you can see, the presentation is called Digital Tools for EAP. Now, I, I do want to say, though, that um, there's lots of tools that uh, could be used in a variety of ways, in a variety of contexts. So even if you're not teaching EAP, stick around, and uh, hopefully there will be something interesting here for you. So maybe before we start, actually, uh, we can't do a show of hands, but maybe in the chat box, if everyone could just put quickly what your teaching context is. Is it EAP? Is it Settlement English? Is it Young Learners? So just take a, take a moment here if you don't mind sharing with the group, because uh, that can help me better kind of tailor uh, the, the things I have to say to the context of the people in the, in the room, in the chat room. Okay, so I see some settlements and EAP, okay. Okay. All right, so some link, um, all kinds of different things. So, interesting, okay, so, um, once again, this is coming from an EAP background, but there's lots and lots of applications of the things I'll share today. Um, so I'll start by talking a little bit about where the inspiration for this presentation came from. Um, so I teach EAP at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, and as in most EAP courses, not only do we teach uh, uh, ESL English skills, but also some academic skills, so things like uh, text annotation, note-taking, note-making. Um, why do we teach them? Uh, because we, we think that they're important for students, not only uh, comprehension of, for example, a text in the moment, but for their future academic success. Now, in my courses, I was teaching these, these skills in an analog way, so on pen and paper, right? So you distribute an article. Uh, and you uh, train students to uh, take notes in the margins, to highlight certain aspects of the text, uh, and things like that. But what I was finding, of course, is that uh, when students were moving on to their academic career, so uh, to their academic studies, um, they were actually reading most of their texts uh, digitally. So, for example, uh, most academic journals nowadays, when you download an article, it's, it's in PDF. You read it on your computer. You read it on your tablet. Uh, professors distribute lecture notes in PDF or PPT format. Um, and students inevitably pirate textbooks. So sometimes they, they circulate in JPEG formula, format. So what I was finding was uh, there was this gap. Um, I was teaching uh, analog academic skills in class, but then as soon as they would have to in a real context, apply these skills, they weren't. Um, even within the, the confines of the own, my own EAP uh, classroom, right, there was the, uh, the research component. So uh, students over the course of the, this, the, the course would have to um, choose a topic, download articles, read them, and, and produce a piece of writing. So even within my own classroom, uh, in the morning, for example, we could be doing a reading lesson uh, and uh, doing an annotation uh, on, a, on an article in the textbook. But then in the afternoon, we'd go to the writing part of the class, and they would be downloading PDFs and just not doing anything, not applying any of these important academic skills. Um, and I don't think it was because they didn't want to or they didn't see the importance of uh, annotation or note-taking, but they just 
didn't know how. They couldn't make this connection between what they were doing in the EAP reading class, for example, and their academic reality. They just didn't have uh, the ability or they hadn't taken the time to think how they could transfer uh, the skills that they had been learning. And so this was happening in my own class. So this is where, um, uh, this is the inspiration for, for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so perhaps some of you have seen this in your own classes with your own students. Um, this type of, the, the gap between uh, the classroom and then reality. Um, so feel free to, to comment there in the, in the box. Maybe you've seen this as well. Uh, maybe not just with an academic reading, but it could be uh, an article for review in the workplace uh, or something like this. So feel free to kind of comment along if you've seen something like that. Um, so what I want to talk about today is um, how to close the skills gap. So I think for the most relevant EAP course content, you have to uh, present both the analog and the digital versions of the essential skills. Um, uh, students nowadays have to have multiple literacies and they need to have the accompanying uh, skills for those literacies. We have to allow students time to practice the skills that we teach them and of course uh, include both types of skill sets in assessments. Um, so this is what uh, we'll talk about today. It's not about completely changing the skills. It's, a, it's the same skills in the base. Uh, but it's about t changing the way we teach them, um, how we allow students to uh, practice them and carry them out, and how we assess them. Okay, so it's just a, it's not completely changing everything, but just changing the how. Um, I'm also going to share with you uh, some software, some apps for performing these skills and carrying these skills out on different devices, different platforms, and then how to apply them in the classroom. So that's a really important part of the presentation. Um, is the application, the practical application. Um, so as I go along, I, I, have, I have my eye here on the chat box. Um, if you have any questions about, uh, about the skills, about the, the programs, or about application, some ideas for application, uh, just jump in there, feel free, and uh, I'll, I'll be kind of uh, attending the questions as we go along. Um, I will note as well that um, there, I will have the slides available that I'm going to be talking about, and they have live links. So any of the programs um, that I talk about will have the links available for you um, if you download the slides. So there, and there also any of these programs are very Googleable. So pop the name into Google, and it's usually the first search result. Okay, so here we go. So the first skill I want to talk about is annotation, so text annotation. Now, we could, we could talk all day about the, the definition of these skills and what they are, but, but let's just keep it simple here. When I talk about annotation, I'm talking about the marking up uh, of a text. Um, so that could be uh, highlighting, underlining, anything we do within the confines of a text. Um, it, enumerating, using different symbols, and all kinds of things like that. So this is what I, what I mean when I talk about annotation. I'm just seeing here in the, in the chat box, is Googleable an official term? It is now, eh? Uh, use dictates uh, uh, evolution of the language, doesn't it? So it's, it is a new term now. Um, OK, so annotation. Uh, here's an example. Just, um, just, uh, just to get us all on the same page here, um, something that happens within the confines of the page. Very familiar. Um, we all have our ways of teaching this. We all have our reasons why we teach annotation. Okay, so now let's move text annotation from the page with pencils, pens, highlighters, markers uh, to the digital context uh, onto a PDF. Um, so the essential tool here is a PDF reader, and this could be on a laptop, on a tablet, whether it be an iPad, an Android tablet, or what have you. But the challenge is, is some PDF readers don't support annotation. So meaning that you can just read articles uh, using these PDF readers. You can't annotate the articles. You can't make any changes. You can't write on it. Um, so what I've given here are three uh, free solutions. Adobe X or Adobe 10 uh, and above uh, allows um, uh, annotation. And this is uh, the, 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 probably the most common uh, PDF reader that we all encounter. Um, Foxit Reader is a PDF reader that's, that's wonderful, available for all platforms. Um, we also have, uh, for the Mac, we have Skim 
and then the preview uh, PDF reader that's built in uh, on the Mac. Um, so now, why is these so useful? Uh, because you can annotate the text. So you can do basically everything you can do when you annotate a text by hand. You can highlight, underline, draw shapes. Uh, you can add uh, notes and comments. And what many of these PDF readers allow is, for example, you can uh, search the, the text. You can search the comments uh, for keywords. Um, you can, there's a spell checker plugin. So I, I know spell checkers can be a little bit contentious among teachers, um, but uh, it, it does allow uh, for that. And a neat feature of the Foxit Reader and Skim is that they allow compilation and manipulation of user entered comments. And that has some really neat applications uh, for uh, the classroom, which I'll, I'll get to in one minute. I'll show you in a sec. Okay, so. Uh, for example, let, so let me just show you some screenshots. Uh, so this is, these are some screenshots from Foxit Reader. Okay, so you see it has a, a, a comment uh, feature, and you can uh, annotate the text in a variety of ways. Uh, here's some examples. Uh, so we can just use a typewriting tool and just add uh, text right into the margins, highlight, underline, color code, um, and things like this. Uh, we can add uh, comments uh, into the margins. So this is uh, the comment function I was referring to earlier. And this is an example of the compilation of comments uh, tool I just mentioned that's available uh, in Foxit Reader amongst others. Uh, so anything, I'll just go back to the previous slide, anything that's added into a comment box in the margins can then be automatically compiled onto one page. Okay, so uh, extracting the comments out and bringing them together. Um, can we save these changes on the PDF? Yes. And so that's a really important aspect. So a student can mark up an article and save it. And especially, for example, if um, uh, the article is being used for a future uh, piece of writing, it's really important to have that uh, note taking um, and that annotation uh, be able to be saved so they don't have to start from scratch each time they reopen the article. So that's, that's and that is what differentiates uh, these newer PDF readers from old PDF readers where you could mark something up but it wouldn't save the comments. Okay, now, um, moving to PDF annotation on the iPad or other tablets. Um, Tablets uh, with a touch screen allow for handwritten notes, as they're called, in addition to typewritten notes. So, of course, if we're annotating a PDF on a computer, we have to enter the text, and we have to do all of that writing uh, with the mouse, And uh, whereas the, the tablet allows for handwritten notes. So you can either use your finger or a stylus. So for those of you that maybe haven't used a stylus on a tablet, it's basically a pen um, with a, a round end. But what it allows you to do is to write directly on the tablet as if it were a, a book or a notebook. And it's a really, really intuitive transition to the digital uh, annotation. It's just like taking notes in the book, more or less. You, ha you can't put the, the side of your hand down uh, on the tablet, but it's, it's very intuitive. The challenge here, though, is on tablets, um, some PDF readers um, allow for handwritten notes, but not all of them. And then there's many programs and apps that allow you to take notes, but they don't allow you to import a PDF. So the challenge is finding uh, programs that allow for both, or apps that allow for both. Um, so here I just have a list. There are many, many, many apps um, available for the different platforms that allow for both handwriting uh, and annotation of PDFs. I've just given you um, a, a selection here, both for iPad and Android. And you know what? Good old Adobe Reader uh, is, is the most, once again, the most common reader. And the last couple of years, Adobe Reader has really come a long way. And it allows for, uh, for both handwriting and annotation of PDFs. Uh, you have a variety here. So if your students are getting their, their tablets set up um, for study, just make sure they have a, a, a PDF reader that allows for handwriting. Okay, this is just a screenshot of, of this. So um, a PDF that's been annotated by hand. Okay, so for someone, maybe for some of us that don't uh, own a tablet or have never um, had the uh, pleasure of interacting uh, with the touch screen in this way, this is what it looks like, right? So you could have a document uh, that is a, a PDF, right? Um, maybe converted from a Word document. And here you can see you can mark it up by hand. 
this person has wonderful, neat handwriting, um, but of course it could uh, it could be just as neat or messy as your handwriting is. Um, annotating on e-readers. Okay, so we have a laptop, we have tablets like iPad um, or an Android tablet, and we also have um, dedicated e-readers, Kindle, Kobo, Sony e-readers. Now, each one is different, um, but what the most, the modern uh, incarnations of these e-readers have nowadays is all of them have some sort of annotation tool. Um, anyone, if, if you have uh, used e-readers or if your students have used e-readers, feel free to, to, uh, to let us know which readers and which platforms you've uh, been using uh, in the comments. Um, so because each platform is different, um, the annotation tool will be slightly different, but do encourage your students to seek out the annotation tool. Now on some of the older e-readers, either they don't have an annotation tool or there's not a touch screen, so it can be slow going, um, but just encourage your students to seek out the annotation tool if they have a newer e-reader. Um, okay, I, I, great idea here from Ryan just in the, in the chat uh, that this annotation would be great as a quiz, uh, indeed. It circulate the quiz um, as a PDF, they have to write it out and then send it back to you. Great idea. Let's talk about now annotation um, of the web. Okay, so we've talked about annotating PDF documents. Um, what about uh, either a reading that's delivered in HTML format, meaning it's, it's like a web page, it's web-based, or if students are doing um, just research on the general web. Maybe they're not quite at the level yet where they're downloading journal articles. Maybe they're at a lower level of EAP, uh, or they're just their 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 research is primarily Google-based. For so, for example, uh, students who are not doing EAP at all, they're just uh, researching for uh, a, a business context or a life context. So, how do you annotate a web page without copying and pasting it somewhere else and printing it out? This is the question. Um, Aha, someone's beat me to it, Margarita Digo. So you can see here, um, we have lots of options for annotating web pages. There's so many options. I just, I'm going to share a few with you today. Uh, Digo is one, okay. Uh, here's two more, uh, Ruhit, uh, Annotate. And the one I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit more detail is Scribal, okay. If you have any other, there's so many great ones, feel free to share them in, in the chat. Um, any that you've used to annotate web pages. Okay, so what, what Scribal allows is it lets you annotate right in your browser. Uh, you actually install a toolbar at the top of the browser. It lets you um, organize the notes, tag them, color code them, and then of course store them, save them, and share them with others. So let's just take a look at uh, a screenshot. Okay, here's a screenshot of a Wikipedia article. Wikipedia, of course, uh, maybe a no-no in strict EAP circles, but uh, for all our intents and purposes today, uh, let's take a look. Um, so you can see um, some highlighting. You can uh, change the color of text, underline. Uh, you can add comments uh, to the margins of the text. Um, it really allows um, just as much annotation uh, as, you, uh, as, you, as you can. Up here, you can see the scribal toolbar. And, okay, so that is uh, kind of what Scribble allows you to do. Let's talk about now what you can do with it. Um, oh, before we do so, let's just uh, take a look. I have a question from Nathan. Is the legend created by you? Um, I think so. I think you can, you know, say, for example, let's go just go back to the screenshot. Um, uh, if this legend here. So if you want to say, okay, anything highlighted in blue is words off the academic vocabulary list, or um, uh, in yellow is the thesis statement. Um, uh, green comments on the side could be uh, questions for the rest of the group, for example. So I think it is, you can set up your own legend. And it is indeed, uh, Natalia, it is indeed very handy, um, very interesting. Uh, you, you could think, for example, um, uh, you could send students uh, to a web page uh, that you have pre-annotated, for example, if you're teaching uh, the skill of being able to uh, point out, identify a thesis statement, um, or you know, um, supporting arguments, you could uh, mark up a page and send students a link, for example. 
Let's talk about some other classroom ideas. Okay, so in the most simple, straightforward uh, incarnation of the digital incarnation of these academic skills, instead of photocopying your article and distributing it to the class, why don't you distribute it via uh, in a PDF? Via it could be email. If you use a learning platform, uh, it could be uh, via Blackboard or Edmodo or what have you. Um, you in, instead of having students mark up the article digitally or mark up the article in an analog way, have them mark it up, save the PDF, and submit it back to you uh, or submit it uh, to each other uh, for group work. And once again, you can say, uh, for example. Uh, Highlight the thesis statement in yellow, uh, and you, you can set out a legend of different symbols, colors, or, or whatever to go along with uh, what you're teaching in your classroom. Um, you could use Foxit's comment compilation tool, okay, which I showed you a few slides back, to have students automatically extract their comments and maybe create a vocab list. So for you say, for example, um, make a comment box uh, wherever you see um, a, a word off of the academic vo uh, word list. And then at the end, they, they can generate this, this page, this compilation, and they have kind of a, a self-standing, standalone uh, vocabulary list uh, that they can use for study purposes. They could cut it up to make flashcards. They could circulate it amongst their um, uh, classmates or what have you. I um, have an interesting comment here from Glenn. It would be great for instructors to use this in discussion forums to highlight student conversations. Yeah, exactly. When we're highlighting uh, the web, highlighting HTML, um, it doesn't have to be a, um, a web page or an encyclopedia it can, or an article. It could be, it can be anything. So that's a great idea. Anyone else, uh, feel free to chime in with some ways that you could uh, integrate this digital annotation into the classroom. Um, now, one thing that you may find, as I certainly have with my students, digitally annotating a text can be slow, especially if you're doing it on a laptop. Um, it, it, it's, it's slower than doing it by hand. The handwritten notes on the tablet go a bit faster, um, but it can be slow. So as always, just stress the why. Why are you doing this? Um, we annotate a text uh, to increase comprehension at the time of reading. It helps us remember uh, more of what we read after. Um, it helps us uh, keep our engagement. You know, with, when you're slogging through an, a heavy academic text, uh, taking, annotating the text uh, helps you stay engaged. And of course, if you're using the text for future reading, writing, uh, or work, um, our notes are very important. I have an idea uh, from Nathan here. Yeah, exactly. Use it with transcripts. Um, to highlight the difference between uh, spoken and written language, exactly. Um, so there's one that, no matter what your context, be it EAP or other, um, it's a great way to highlight that. Um, so lots and lots of ways that we could use this. Okay, let's move on to note making. So once again, how I'm using the word note making is uh, what you do with a, a text. It could be um, a text or, or a listening extract, but outside of the margins. So let's say on a, on a separate piece of paper, if we're doing it in an analog way. So what could it be? It could be generating charts or diagrams using information, um, compiling lists of key terms, predicting or generating uh, exam questions, uh, making summaries doing something with the article or the listening extract after the fact, or making uh, study sheets or cheat sheets. So this is what I mean when I talk about note making in a very general way. Okay, so let's talk about doing this digitally. Okay, so there's lots and lots and lots of ways that you can do note making uh, in a digital way. Uh, the most simple, most straightforward, and the, the, the piece of software that students are most familiar with is probably Microsoft Word or any text editor um, can be used for note making. And, and in a moment, I will talk, give some examples uh, and talk about that. Um, the tablet uh, apps for uh, iPad and tablets that I've already mentioned that allow you to do handwritten notes or to create text uh, typed notes, those also allow for note making. We have mind mapping software such as uh, FreeMind or XMind. So uh, these here, as I mentioned before, all of these uh, software names here within the, the presentation are links. Um, so um, uh, you can download the software later if it interests you. 
And then we have uh, specialized note-taking software, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in detail in a moment. Okay, so let's just talk about these different options uh, and how they can be used uh, for digital note making. Okay, so here's mind mapping software. For those of you that haven't used it before, there are lots and lots and lots of different mind mapping uh, software. I've given you a few, FreeMind, XMind. Feel free to add in the chat box any that you use. So as you can see here, um, it, it allows uh, you or students to make notes in a nonlinear way, okay? Um, using symbols, shapes, uh, webs, maps, uh, or what have you. So this, um, uh, for example, after a reading, uh, you can uh, have students create a, a mind map or pre-reading idea, uh, similar, generating vocabulary instead of doing it on the board or doing it on a piece of paper in groups, I uh, happen to do it digitally. Uh, you can still use the same color coding, and uh, you can add symbols and uh, the like, just like you can when you do it on paper. So it's, once again, it's the same skill. You're just doing it uh, in a different medium. Okay. Now, the types of software that I think just uh, have endless potential for uh, note-making, note-taking, uh, are, are note-taking uh, software suites. Um, available for PC, for Mac, and mobile devices. The two most popular ones are uh, Microsoft OneNote and Evernote. Now, OneNote is bundled with Microsoft Office. So you may even actually have this on your computer and you just have never opened it. That was certainly my case when I started exploring these options. Um, and we also have Evernote, which is a very, very, very popular um, uh, note-taking uh, program. It's, it's freemium meaning that you get the basic set of features for free. You can download and use it for free. And uh, if you want the really advanced features or if you want to store a lot of information in it, you do have to pay. Um, but you can do a lot with it in the free version. Yes, I see Natalia is an Evernote user. There are a lot of Evernote uh, fans out there. I, I certainly use it myself. Um, OneNote and Evernote uh, both allow for um, uh, synchronization between devices. Um, so, for example, you can have Evernote installed on your uh, desktop at, at work, on your laptop at home, and uh, on your tablet or phone, and it will sync notes between them all. Uh, so it's really great. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about these programs uh, in detail. Yes, okay, we got lots of Evernote lovers out there. I like it too. So what do they allow for? I'm going to show you some screenshots sh shots in a minute. Maybe it will make uh, note-taking software converts out of all of you. They're really great. Um, not just for, for the classroom, but just for life in general. But uh, So what do they allow for? So you can, you can do anything in them. You can bring in uh, free-form notes, so notes either written, drawn by hand or drawn with a mouse. You can type notes. You can bring photos, graphics, sound files, PDFs uh, into these programs. Anything you bring in can be tagged, sorted, and manipulated, and searched through. Uh, so, for example, when you bring a PDF in, uh, in most of these programs, it makes the text in the PDFs searchable. Okay, so you can you can search for keywords and very easily find what you're looking for. Um, what's really neat about uh, these programs is they you can record audio or video, and stamp the notes that you take with the recording time. Okay, so for example, uh, you a student goes to a lecture, press record, it starts recording the audio, and it's going to save that audio in the program. But at the same time as it records, you can be typing notes, and every so often th throughout the notes, it will stamp it with the time, the corresponding time from the sound file. So it's a really good way for students, especially in, imagine that first semester at university, to be able to go back and see where their notes correspond with the recording of the lecture. You could also see how this could be used, um, for example, uh, in a business meeting uh, or at a conference uh, for those that aren't uh, working with students in an EAP setting. Uh, it has lots and lots of uh, potential. Um, in these, in these note-taking programs, you can uh, bring in templates. So if you use something like Cornell method or you use a special uh, template for the SQ4R or something like that, you can bring them in. There's lots freely available on the web where you can make them. And one really cool thing, well, it's, it's cool from a practical standpoint, um, is that it, they allow for the editing of locked PDFs. So 
One thing I, I didn't mention in the discussion of uh, annotating PDFs is that sometimes you download a PDF from an, a, a, an academic journal, for example, and it's locked for editing, meaning that you can't annotate it, you can't highlight it, you can't make any changes. But if you import the PDF into OneNote, for example, it will allow you to edit on top, like it, it, it saves the annotations as a layer on top of the PDF, so it actually allows you to get around the, the locking of a, of a PDF. Um, I, I see a comment here talking about Evernote, had it, maybe didn't use it. Um, these programs kind of um, have so much potential that you really kind of, there's a, a bit of a learning curve, how to use it, how to integrate it into your life or into your teaching. Um, so what maybe I can give you today are just some ways that you could encourage uh, your students to use it. Um, and it's really about that, finding the way to integrate it into, into your life or to the classroom. Okay, so this is a screenshot of OneNote. Okay, um, it looks a bit overwhelming, but what it is, uh, you have some tabs up here uh, where you can save uh, different, uh, different notes. Uh, you have a full array of uh, editing tools. You can see here the mixed media. I can have uh, files uh, embedded. I can have graphics uh, embedded uh, directly. Here's a link to a, a video file. So I encourage you to open up Microsoft Office on your computer. Uh, you may have it in there. Play around with it. Okay, so let's talk about some applications, some practical applications for note making in the classroom. So as, for example, a post-reading or post-listening task, instead of having the students do a typical um, summary uh, or to answer a series of questions, uh, what you can have them do is to have them make a digital study sheet or cheat sheet. Um, uh, there's lots of different names for it. Uh, so for example, and I'll show you an example of this in a moment. Say, here's an article. OK, I want you to read it. Um, and after, I want you to make a sheet that in a graphic way uh, includes the most important uh, and most salient pieces of information from the article. So it could include uh, main points. Uh, it could include uh, extracting and compiling a vocabulary list. It could it include a short summary. It could include, uh, if, for example, if there's a process described in the article, turning that process into a graph or a chart. Um, and I've done this uh, in, in an advanced EAP class, and I found it an excellent way to, to gauge students' comprehension. Um, if a student doesn't really get the article, if they haven't really grasped the main points, or if they haven't really um, grasped uh, the description of the process, for example, they can't turn it into a, 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 a chart or um, a, a graph. Um, and I, I will show you an example in a moment. But a, a thing about this as well is, whereas with the digital annotation of a text, it was slower than doing it by hand, making a, a study sheet digitally is actually faster than making a study sheet uh, by hand. So that's, that's uh, the, the flip side to uh, the, the digital version of this skill. Let me show you an example. This is actually from one of my students. Uh, this was in an uh, advanced EAP class. Um, so we read an article you can see called Strategies for Culture Shock, okay? And so this is the sheet she made after. So uh, what did she uh, identify as the most important information from the article? Um, is, so we have here, this, this article, for example, highlighted the four stages of culture shock, okay? So she's, uh, in point form, um, just summarized these four stages. She's uh, put up here some key definitions, so key vocabulary uh, from this article. Uh, she made a graph uh, kind of uh, representing the description of culture shock that was described in the article. Uh, she's generated a short summary, and she's organized in uh, table form uh, two studies that were um, uh, described in uh, the article. And now all of this, of course, is paraphrased in her own words. Um, so really, uh, you can't do this unless you've understood an article. And I've actually used um, study sheets uh, as an, an assessment. So as opposed to um, uh, just a, to, to writing a text or a response, I've had students generate study sheets because it really is an accurate uh, gauge of students' comprehension. Um, 
I'm just noticing here a question from Janice. How do students share their OneNote results with you? Uh, you do have the option to share notes. Um, uh, the, different, the different programs allow you to share notes uh, in different ways, either um, uh, by email, by links, and to just share for viewing only or to share for editing. So it depends a little bit on the program. But uh, with something like OneNote, you can share results. So that's a good question. Uh, in this case, the student made this study sheet in Microsoft Word. So she just um, she submitted through, uh, in this case, we use Blackboard. She submitted through Blackboard to me. Um, but uh, if it's done in OneNote, you can share the link. Uh, you can export and save the file as well. If anyone else has uh, done uh, study sheets, cheat sheets, graphic organizers, infographics uh, with, with reading, feel free to, uh, to uh, pipe in with some comments on how it went, uh, pitfalls, uh, recommendations there in the comments. Okay. So I'm going to talk now about another piece of software. This is a piece of software now um, that is really very, very most useful for, for students who are studying EAP who are going to be uh, performing research in the university in the future. But I'm going to share with you and talk about it for um, because it also uh, bibliographic managers can be used to support just personal personal research. Um, if a, a person has um, a personal research project or professional research project. Um, and also, this can be really, really useful. These programs can be useful for us uh, as teachers if we're pursuing our own, uh, for example, graduate studies or professional development. Um, so uh, these are wonderful pieces of software with lots of applications. Um, OK, so what are bibliographic managers? So these are software that allow us to organize the research and writing process. Uh, for one. So it lets you um, integrate with your search process. If you're looking for articles or web pages or information, uh, it integrates with the search process. It allows you to organize and store um, any articles or web pages you may find, and also to organize and store those annotations you may make to those web pages or articles. Um, and it allows you to also create notes, freestanding notes, on whatever pieces of, of information you find, and to store them all together. So that's the first main purpose of a bibliographic organizer or manager. Um, and the other one is allows you, if we are doing research in an academic context, to quickly, very quickly create bibliographies in a, in a variety of uh, citation styles. So some of you may have used them before. And uh, feel free to add in the comments here which ones you've used. Um, we have kind of two categories. There's institutionally sponsored um, bibliographic managers, such as RefWorks or EndNote. Uh, Dalhousie, for example, uh, uh, uses RefWorks. Um, these ones cost money, lots of money, but usually a, a university will um, uh, provide uh, use of one of these managers for its students and staff. But there are some free versions, uh, Zotero, Mendeley, amongst others. And so I'm going to give some examples today of, uh, from Zotero, which is the one I actually personally used during uh, my graduate work. And it, uh, it saved me. I couldn't have done that a degree without, uh, without Zotero. So I'm, I'll, I'm, I'm preaching with lots of passion about uh, the usefulness and, and uh, wonderful flexibility of these programs. Um, anyone else out there? Anyone else use any bibliographic managers or have you used? I know some of them, uh, they've, they've evolved a lot over the years. Um, OK, so some RefWorks users. Anyone use Zotero? OK, well, I'm going to tell you about Zotero. Maybe we'll get some new users. OK, so how does Zotero work? Zotero is, there's a couple of different ways to use it and to, um, uh, to integrate it into your computer. The most common way is. It's actually um, an add-on to the Firefox browser. So what it does, um, it hides at the bottom of the browser window. Um, here it's, it's expanded, but it, it, it kind of uh, hides at the bottom. And when you press on the name Zotero, it expands up. So it doesn't always take up half of the web page. Uh, as you see here, it kind of hides at the bottom and you can open it up. But what it does is these programs, um, they 
automatically sense when you are on um, a, a, a web page. It could be on uh, the university catalog. It could be on Google, Google Scholar. Um, and what it automatically does is it senses and can find all of the metadata for a page. So for example, this is um, an entry on the Library of Congress uh, online catalog. It could be a university catalog. It could be a Google Scholar search. And when it finds something um, that it senses as an information source, it puts a little symbol up in the address bar of your browser. And if you click on that, it automatically extracts into Zotero and creates an entry. It, it extracts all the metadata. So the author name, the year, uh, the, the place of publication, uh, the type of source, the page, any, any bibliographic information that could be useful. It automatically extracts that. If there's a PDF available, it automatically extracts and downloads it. And if it's a web page as opposed to a PDF, it takes a, a snapshot. And it automatically saves those all together in one place. So you can see it has a kind of um, iTunes-esque interface. So you can see the entry. Um, it, it just attaches everything there. And what it does, it creates um, uh, an entry. Here you have. Uh, some tabs, you can um, add notes to the entry. Um, you can add other attachments um, to it. Uh, and you can tag them and do all of the things uh, that uh, could allow you to search and uh, things like this. I'm just looking at the comments here. Some, some folks used uh, Word documents when they were doing research. Uh, and, those, and those do the trick. But you get, I'll, I'll show you in a moment why something like Zotero, these, these bibliographic organizers, just have a lot more functionality. Scraps of paper work as well. But what these allow you to do um, is, uh, especially when it comes to making a bibliography, it will save you a lot of time. They even have to question. Do these work with journals behind paywalls? Um, so yes, but I mean, you still have to have access to the journal. Uh, so you have to have access to the journal that's behind the paywall. So uh, for example, um, if I'm accessing journals to which I have access uh, with my Dalhousie credentials, I log in with my Dalhousie login, um, and then I can access them. And But still, yeah, it will. I, generate the icon, I click, and it automatically creates the entry. So it, so it can um, work both with academic journals, uh, Google uh, Scholar, uh, or just a simple web page. So that's really cool. But what's most cool, I'll show you here, is so at that moment, whether it's you or your students, it's 2 AM, you finished a paper. Uh, of course, no, you're not finishing at 2 AM. So you're finishing at you know, 8 PM, uh, two days before it's due, of course. But it comes time to generate that bibliography. And um, it, so instead of having to slog through, find all of the sources you've consulted, and create that bibliography from scratch, trying to remember if you use a period or a comma after the author's name in APA, um, you press a button, you select the resources you want, you press a button, and it automatically generates a bibliography using the sources that you want. And also, it has, a, it has basically all of the citation styles you could ever want or need. And it makes them, uh, it generates a bibliography. So all you have to do in that case is just proofread the bibliography, OK, as opposed to creating it from scratch. And this was certainly a godsend. It saves, it's a huge time saver, um, both uh, for the student and as it for the teacher as well. And I'll, I'll talk about how, uh, how in a moment. OK, so how could we use Zotero in the classroom? Um, one um, uh, interesting uh, uh, classroom activity that I certainly do at the advanced EAP level is an annotated bibliography. So uh, one of the, the first steps in the research process is um, identifying some uh, sources of information and then creating an annotated bibliography. So for each source, uh, making a small summary and evaluation of the source, talking about how it relates uh, to the research topic or what have you. Um, so imagine, uh, and you can, of course, you can do this uh, in Microsoft Word. But um, if you wanted to change it up, you could have them generate this in Zotero. So they find the source online. They import it into Zotero. Um, they, in Zotero, make their notes. They can read and annotate directly into Zotero. It saves all the notes there. 
And then you can use the create report feature. So this is, you can create a bibliography, but you can also create a report. So what that does is you choose um, a resource. Let me show you a screenshot. It generates the, the title, the bibliographic information, and it compiles together any notes that the student has entered on, on that source. So uh, this could be um, used for annotated bibliography, as well as something uh, like a, a response, a critique, or even a summary. Um, they can put the note right in Zotero and uh, generate this report. So once again, yeah, you can do it in Microsoft Word, but getting the students in the habit of using Zotero helps them organize the whole research process, keep all these different elements, the article, the notes, the summary, uh, the evaluation, all in one place that's easily accessible, easily findable later. Um, Ryan, yeah, you said it sounds incredible. They really are. I, I am definitely a convert to bibliographic uh, managers. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to talk about, I have another kind of um, activity I want to talk about, uh, another way to use Evernote. But before we do so, let me just go back. Uh, any questions so far about uh, what I've talked about? So annotation, uh, note making, bibliographic managers, um, uh, the, the note taking software, uh, PDF readers, anything, anything so far, anything that comes to mind? No question is too simple. I, I know that um, uh, as, as, as uh, Nathan mentioned as well, sometimes, you know, Trying to bring too many programs into the classroom at once it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, so it's it's definitely recommended to just kind of uh, you know switch it up once in a while. For example, if you do four days a week, you do annotation uh, in the textbook or on a photocopied article. Um, why not one day uh, have them do it digitally? So just to allow them the chance to practice both skill sets. Okay, are we getting a sound in Visio freeze? Okay, I'm just going to kind of keep going. Hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully you can see me. Um, okay, so hopefully it uh, keeps going. Um, does Zotero work with tablets too? Um, it can integrate into tablets. You know what, I'm not sure. I, I'll have to check that out and let you know uh, if you can, um, if there's a specific app for Zotero. Definitely it's available on all platforms uh, and it is, it's open source. Uh, there's so much documentation on the web on how to use it, um, uh, tips, tricks, and all that type of thing. What format can you save Zotero in? So anything that it, 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 um, uh, that it generates, for example, reports or a bibliography, you can choose. You can generate it uh, in HTML in a or in a Word document. So then you can copy and paste it into your, um, into your essay, for example. Um, and uh, so, or, or you could save it as a, you could export it to uh, Microsoft Word, save it as a PDF. Um, they, okay, they do have a Chrome extension. So Zotero so used to just be a Firefox add-in, but now they've made what they call Zotero standalone. So it's a standalone program and you can um, use it uh, with the browser of your choice, uh, a Chrome extension. In that case, you have to open both the standalone program as well as your browser, um, as opposed to it, it just, being housed in the bottom of your browser, but they do, uh, in recent years, they've made it available for all browsers. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, lots of questions here. Um, okay, so uh, an interesting question here about some online um, uh, skills, advanced English, prior to university? Maybe, Laura Lee, that's a good question. Maybe we'll come back to that just at the end because I'm sure that we have, like, I'm sure everyone has a ton of stuff they could add and contribute to answer your question. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk quickly about one more use of Evernote and then Laura Lee, I'll come back and maybe we can do a kind of group brainstorming on that because um, there are a ton of online resources for academic skills. Okay, so don't let me forget. I'll definitely come back to that. Um, now, let's talk about Evernote uh, just quickly for uh, one last, um, the last little bit of this presentation today. Okay, so Evernote was the 
other um, note-making, note-taking uh, software that we talked about. This one is the, is the free one. And Evernote can be used as a personalized language learning kind of notebook that can really support autonomous learning, whether it's a student who's doing self-study or to support uh, classroom learning. And um, I'm going to give an example because I'm actually using Evernote. To, I've made it as a personalized language learning notebook because I'm learning Portuguese. And I'm, I'm, I'm supporting my own learning with this. So I'm going to kind of uh, describe how I use it uh, from a personal standpoint, but you can definitely see how it could be applied uh, to your students. Um, OK, am I having some problems here? I'm going to try to log out and in, use the button. OK, Zion is giving me. All right, I'm back. All right, I hope you can hear me. I hope you can see me. All right, sorry for that little technical glitch. Uh, I guess the inevitable uh, glitches that come up during a, a webinar. Um, good, I hope you had a nice fruitful discussion um, uh, there. Oh, whoops. Oh, I guess you could hear me the whole time. Glenn, I took the wrong instructions. Anyway, I'm back. Um, all right, let me get back to talking about Evernote here. So with Evernote, you can uh, create a great language learning notebook for autonomous learning. So what, what, what the note-taking software allows you to do is to create uh, notebooks, which are sets of notes, okay? And uh, of course, you can compile together all kinds of different media, okay? Um, so for example, together you can bring together web pages, uh, articles, video clips, text snippets, PDFs. So you could think of how you can bring together in one place um, many, many different uh, media that support language learning. So for example, uh, if I generate a vocabulary list, um, I can bring it into Evernote. I can bring, uh, if I find some a PDF version of a grammar book, I can edit, I can annotate, add my own comments to that, bring it into Evernote. Uh, if I find an interesting web page, maybe with uh, some interesting comments uh, on the language I'm trying to use, uh, I can bring it in. I can annotate it and bring it and store it together in Evernote. I can link notes together. So for example, if, if, I'm, uh, if I have a document that's talking about the uh, simple past, and I know I have a, a PDF grammar book with a really good explanation, I can just create a link that's a live link so I can jump between different notes. And it also, uh, I can have a, a note in my, uh, my notebook on Evernote that's a journal. Um, so uh, every day, for example, I try to do a little bit of writing uh, in Portuguese. Uh, so I have my journal. Uh, each day I create an entry and just do a little bit of writing. It's right there. Um, I could also make a spoken journal because with Evernote, you can uh, use um, sound, uh, you can record sound and bring that in. So what it just allows me to do is to have all these little bits and pieces of um, my interaction with the language, my language learning, my interaction with authentic text and audio. And instead of having a bunch of web links and then a file on my computer where I have a, a, a PDF and then maybe a journal, um, I can uh, bring them together. So that's how you can use Evernote. All right, so uh, Glenn is saying we should wrap it up here and take a few questions. I'm just going to really quickly conclude. So start adding your questions uh, into the box if you have any. 
Um, so remember, it's kind of the goal of our, the EAP course, and so where this whole, this, what we've been talking about today comes from, this is to prepare our students for academic success. When we, when we, that's what, what's what EAP courses are for. Now we have to prepare them for their reality. So not the one that we may have had, where we were reading off of paper and organizing our research on recipe cards for their reality, where they're downloading PDFs from academic journals uh, from their laptop at home. And if we're not preparing them for that, then we're actually failing them um, uh, as EAP teachers. We're giving them the language skills, true, but in as much as we think that academic skills are important, we need to provide those. And so we have to provide them with the tools and the practice time um, in those tools to accompany the multiple literacies that are going to serve them um, at university. Um, so that kind of brings me to the end. Uh, as you can see here, uh, if you go to my website here, you can find uh, the slides uh, that this presentation I've just given, which once again contains live links to download any of these programs. It has the screenshots too, if you just wanted to take a closer look on, on your own time. Um, so anyone who had any other questions about any of these programs, feel free to add them here. Um, and perhaps if we do have a few minutes, we could get back to Laura Lee's question about study skills. Um, study skills, there's tons of um, uh, uh, resources online. Almost every university uh, has, it's sometimes in their uh, writing center, they have online webinars uh, and, and documents on the different study skills. A lot of Australian universities um, have some self-study modules. Um, I can, uh, if you send me an email, I'm going to leave you here my email, uh, for you or anyone else, um, I'm just typing it into the chat box. Uh, I can, I'll look up, the, there's one that I'm thinking of that's really great. It may be the University of New South Wales, and they have a great um, self-study module uh, on academic skills um, that are really go beyond, it's it perhaps made for English language learners, but it goes beyond um, the, the just something that could be of use to English language learners and just academic skills that are good for EAP success, or excuse me, for academic success in general. If anyone else has any other resources on academic skills that can be accessed online for uh, Laura Lee's daughter, uh, just add them in the chat box there. Um, okay, so uh, I guess thank you everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to Glenn and English Online for organizing it. Um, and uh, it's certainly been a pleasure to, uh, to meet you all, to interact with you all today. And once again, the slides are online, and there's my email. Any questions are, are certainly welcome. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That was uh, amazing. Thank you for being here and uh, giving us your time as well to Nathan. Thank you very much for um, giving us your time. I'll be posting all of these links in uh, Tutela. Um, uh, later on today uh, in the Manitoba uh, EAL uh, group in a, a forum post there. So look for the links there to all the things that Nathan and Jennifer have been talking about. Um, I'm going to take back the presenter right now, Jennifer. Thank you uh, very much for sharing. Um, also, again, if anybody needs um, certificates for attending, I'll put up my email in one second. Please email me uh, as, uh, within an hour or so after the uh, webinar finishes, and um, I can send those out. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. Hopefully you have a wonderful weekend. We'll see those of you who are going to Tessal, Ontario next week.